Yes, I will kick us off for the recording. Hello and welcome everybody to Q plus EDU. We are super thrilled that you're joining us today for our session on using the media for LGBTQ plus equality. My name is Frederick. I am Out Youth's Texas Gender and Sexuality Alliance Network Coordinator. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. And um, auspiciously enough, I'm coming to you from sunny California for this session. So, you know, if you've got any Hollywood leads, definitely share those with us. Um, I'm just here for tech support today. If there are any links shared during our conversation, I'll be dropping those in the chat. If you have questions throughout the conversation, please feel free to add those to the chat or to the Q&A box, and we'll get to them as we can. Um, Rin Gonzalez, Outuse Operations and Programs Director, is going to be our moderator for today's panel, and I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Frederick. Very jealous of sunny California today. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the media, the elusive, finicky media. I'm going to start with introductions, which are a tradition about youth. So when the youth gather at six o'clock for drop-in, they go around and say their name, their age, their pronouns, and answer a question of the day. We're going to do something very similar. I'm going to ask you to tell us your name, your age, your pronouns where you're from, how you identify within the LGBTQIA plus community, and give a physical description of yourself for blind or visually impaired attendees or folks who are joining us via phone. For your ease, I'm putting it in the chat so you have all of the questions. Uh, and it is my prerogative, so I'm gonna start in reverse alphabetical order today, starting with Trevor. Hello, hi guys. My name is Trevor Wilkinson. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am from Abilene, Texas, and I identify as gay in the LGBTQIA plus um, community. And then a visual, English, a visual description. Um, I'm wearing an Adidas, a blackish gray Adidas shirt with sh white stripes down the sides, shoulders, whatever you want to call it. And I have black hair and I have a septum piercing. Thank you, Trevor. Oh, well, hi, my name is Britton Major. Uh, I'm 17 and I use he, him pronouns. I'm from Keller, Texas, and I identify as gay within the community. A visual description of what I look like is I have brown hair, brown eyes, very generic looking, just like, it's not that complex. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you're thinking I'm looking like, it's probably, it's probably pretty accurate. And not three. Uh, hi everybody. My name is Adri Perez. My pronouns are they, them. I am 28 years old, which makes me feel so old now. Um, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and today is actually my very first day um, living in Austin, Texas. So big, big move for me. I, I identify as transgender and queer um, and non-binary uh, as, as part of the LGBTQIA plus community. A uh, physical description of myself, I am centered on the camera. Uh, you can see my full face. I'm wearing a sage green shirt, a floral blazer. Um, I have a septum piercing and glasses and light brown skin with dark brown, almost black hair and uh, some scruffy, scruffy, scruffy facial hair that I'm so proud of and will never shave off. Thank you. And me, my name is Rin Gonzalez. I use they, them, nurse pronouns. I am 36 and I grew up in Texas. So still here. They can't get rid of me. I identify as trans and non-binary and queer and sometimes gay just to simplify everything. Uh, physical description of me, I'm very white, uh, sometimes translucent. I am bald. I am wearing brown glasses today with a blue, navy blue crew neck shirt. And I am also centered in the frame in my office here at Out Youth. Um, with, I am very proud of it, my, my very own rainbow border background window behind me. It's serving very like elementary school teacher vibes for me and I'm living for it. 
But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about telling our stories to the media. So I'm gonna start by asking each of you where our audience might recognize you or your name from, because each of you have been in the media in one way or another. And I'm gonna hop around again, starting with Britain. So I publish an article on Outsports. And if you don't know what Outsports is, Outsports basically is a, um, it's a website where people within the queer community share their stories about what it was like for them in athletics. And so for me, it was a story about me coming out to my soccer team, cross country, and kind of just how I felt as a queer athlete growing up in Keller, Texas. And then obviously published my straight out sports and then got an overwhelming, amazing, positive response from people online, my community, and even like my team in school. So that was a really amazing experience that I got to have all because of out sports and sharing my experience through the media. Uh, that's really cool, uh, Britton. I didn't know that actually. Uh, my name is Adri. Uh, I first shared my story in what was a conservative uh, El Paso magazine where they put me on the cover of it and said uh, what being trans in El Paso was like. It, so it was actually pretty radical that we were able to do that because my, my very cool friend was working there at the time and wanted to um, run a story about, about trans issues at the legislature. And it was 2017 when we were facing the, the bathroom bill. So that's kind of one of the worst, I think one of the first ways that I became um, kind of a big voice in, in the LGBTQ community in El Paso. But now I have the privilege of working as a policy and advocacy strategist for the ACLU of Texas. And so I, I speak to the media in a couple of different ways. And you do it very well and over and over again this year because Texas can't get its shit together. Trevor. Um, first off, I wanted to say, go you guys. I did not know either, either of those. And I'm so happy I learned about that. Um, but I am recognized from um, an event that happened at my school this year. Um, I, was, I was a senior, I just graduated. And I actually got suspended for painting my nails. And instead of taking them off, I got longer ones and I kind of waited it out and it blew up. Um, I was on Good Morning America, CNN, Washington Post, Daily Mail, Out, um, Pink News. Um, yeah, it just really blew up and I got my, with the help of so many people, I got my dress code to be gender neutral forever. And yeah, so that's me. Trevor, we're gonna stick with you because the next question is a good follow-up. What prompted you to share that story with the media in the first place? Um, so essentially the reason why um, I think it blew up the way it did was um, when, it, when the first issue happened and they told me that I would have ISS and that I would be suspended, um, right after that, I made a petition that actually got, I think, around 400,000 signatures. It's like 400,000 right now. Um, and through that, I was, I was going to show my principal and vice principal, like, hey, like, this is really not okay. And they did not care at all. They basically shoved everything that I compiled together in my face and told me, that I would remain suspended until I took my nails off. So at that point, I was really just infuriated and um, I acted on a motion, which turned out to be awesome. But I did act on a motion. And before my phone was taken away, I went to the bathroom. Well, I said I had to go to the bathroom. Um, I went to the bathroom and I took a picture on Snapchat and I flipped off my camera. And I dropped their emails and the school phone number and the superintendent's number and kind of just like, hey, I'm still an ISS and I'm still suspended. Please call them and show them how wrong they are. And little did I know that it was going to turn into a huge thing and a huge, great thing. But yes. What continues to surprise me after all of these years doing this work is that it is the, the things that we often do in the spur of the moment the small things that end up blowing up. Speaking of, 
uh, I do not mean to make it sound like a small thing, Audrey, but well, I don't, and it wasn't a small thing. I, I'm curious what made you share your story in that magazine, in a conservative magazine newspaper in El Paso. Like that, that's, that's an amount of bravery that needs to be recognized. Um, I think that it, what I struggle with so often doing LGBTQIA work is how to reach new and different audiences that, that we don't normally have the, the eye and the ear of and how to be able to share stories and humanize trans people for people who may not want to have trans people humanized for them, right? Um, and so the opportunity, uh, when it presented itself, of course, I, I, I did it because it was with the, one with an interviewer who I really trusted to tell my story in a way that would honor my my truth and my lived experience and also share it in a way that that would reach uh, people who wouldn't normally be presented with that perspective on trans and LGBTQ rights at the Texas legislature. Um, I, it was it was a pretty big thing, I think, and I we actually ran into that same friend and we were reflecting on it later, um, like four years later now, um, and how it was one of the best stories that they, one of the most shared stories that that publication had ever um, shared and ran up to this day. It's still one of the most um, shared stories. Fabulous. You did find it. <laughs> Thanks, Frederick. <laughs> yes, Frederick did find that link and threw it in the chat. Um, and I have to say, as your friend, it's been an honor to watch you grow over the last four years. I didn't realize it had been that long. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about that story before, too, and I, there's just something else I want to add. In so many of the interviews that I did, I think, early on about the trans, about my experience as a trans person, um, were pretty intrusive about questions about my transition or what it means to be trans and where and what I wanted to do with my body. And in some ways, uh, like those things should never be asked of somebody, but, and nobody should be put in that position. But my willingness to be able to do that so early on in the process, like, allowed me to take control of that narrative and take it away from them now, which is something I think that we're seeing a lot now is where the gaps are getting filled in with a lot of misinformation. And that misinformation is being used to push anti-trans legislation. Um, that level of vulnerability is not something that anybody, especially any trans person owes you or anyone. And I will just like say that flat out, but that level of vulnerability um, did allow me to take control of my narrative and not allow for that gray space that allows for the misinformation that people use to restrict trans people's um, access in this life. <laughs> Thank you for being vulnerable. I know that it's done a lot of education and we know that there's still a lot left to do because Texas legislatures, uh, legislators still don't seem to understand um, that trans men exist. Um, we can get into that in a minute. Uh, Britain, what? made you share your story? Because I grew up, I will say, I grew up in Texas. I was one of four gay identified boys on my campus of 3000. Um, there were definitely gay male athletes um, who weren't out, it wasn't safe to be out. What, what made you share your story and be vulnerable in that way? Yeah, so I'd always been really, really comfortable with my sexuality, like throughout my entire life. It wasn't never really like this big secret I had to hide. However, the only, the major roadblock for me was sports. It just was a community that I've been in my entire life where I always just felt a sense of otherness and needing to come out going into my freshman year was really important to me. So I started reading a lot of stories on out sports just to help me learn, gain confidence. And as I was reading them, I couldn't find my story. You know, I couldn't find the one of the junior soccer team who ran cross country. I couldn't find one that I like saw myself in. And so I just felt obligated to share my story for the next, the next person who's going to like look and read the stories and be like, this is all I need to get the confidence to come out. For me, it was really just a chance to tell my story to help the next person, which is why I felt obligated to. 
Thank you for your vulnerability and empathy. That's something that I've noticed a lot about our community. We often do the things that are hard in hopes that it makes it a little bit easier for those who come after us. Um, I do have a follow-up question just so that we have it all out on the table. Can you tell people what sport or sports you play? So I uh, play soccer, cross country, and track. Those three in my school. So running, running, and more running. Got it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we talk about a lot here at Out Youth with our youth is the power of stories and the magic that is in them. Um, This leads into the next question I have for all of you because it's something that we've observed over and over again. The human brain is wired for stories. It has been for millennia. That's how, before we had the printed word, um, before we could even write anything down, like we taught each other things through story. And so stories have an immense power to them that I think is often lost on many of us today. The, the power of our stories. And uh, Trevor, I'm gonna go back over to you because you may have done something in the heat of the moment um, and it got a huge response. Can you tell us more about that? What, what was the response like after your story came out? And actually I'm gonna add a follow-up to what was already on the script. Did that change it all over time? Because we also see that happen a lot, that public attitude will change. Yes, so um, if I had to describe it in any way, I would just say crazy. Um, so the response I got um, online was actually amazing. Um, people from all over, all over. Like my school is getting calls from Canada literally Canada, people in Canada saying how wrong they were for doing this to me. And um, I think that over, after I went on Good Morning America, uh, I think that by the next day I had 60,000 followers on Instagram and it was just so, so much support, like message after message telling me how thankful that they are for me and how inspiring, like it was such an overwhelming feeling, but it, it was overwhelming with joy. Like it was so amazing for me. Um, but um, when I think when something reaches that level of media, backlash is only, is it, it's inevitable 1000%. So I did receive a lot of backlash, um, especially within my own community. Um, I think the most backlash that I got from this experience was from people in West Texas, um, especially in towns that I live in and the surrounding areas. A lot of the adults specifically thought that I either went about it a wrong way or that, or they said rules are rules, even though my school wasn't following them. Um, and there was a lot of hate, honestly. I remember the first week was really rough for me. Um, I almost just like stopped going on social media and stopped like, I almost just kind of threw my phone away and said, I'm just gonna leave it here for a little bit because it was a lot of hatred, especially the adults, more so the adults than anything actually, which was really um, saddening for me, um, but as for my school, it was rough as well for a little bit. Um, a lot of kids supported my cause, but again, they felt that the way I did it wasn't ethical or wasn't the, the respectful way. Um, so there were some issues and there were some events that I wish didn't happen, but um, I just surrounded myself around people who supported me 100%. And as time went by, I got more comfortable and I got more comfortable with looking at all the derogatory and hateful comments. And if anything, it really just pushed me to want to share my story even more and to um, impact as many lives as I could so that people knew that they were not alone. And that although it really was crappy for a little bit, it ended up being the best thing that I have ever been through and I would not change it for the world. And something I also find in common with lots of people who share stories like that, that it's hard and we wouldn't change it for anything. 
I also find it very ironic that the same people who were telling you that rules are rules are probably the same people who are not wearing masks. I'm just gonna leave that right there. Um, and yeah, it's always adults. And it does make me sad being an adult. Um, but there's also a sense of relief that I also have to own that having worked it out, you've, wait, remind me how old you both are, Trevor and Britton. I am 18 and I'll be 19 in a few months. I'm 17. Yeah, so basically I've been working at Out Youth longer than Britain has been alive. Um, so I've seen a lot. And one of the things that I have really enjoyed is seeing that youth are supporting youth by and large. I know that that was not a universal experience of yours, Trevor, but good to know. Um, Britain, what was your reaction? To yours, like I know that you'd mentioned that you wanted to share your story so that people coming after you had a story to look up to. Has anyone reached out? Yeah. This feedback? I was, although didn't have as dramatic response as Trevor had. Mine was more local in my community. I did have a lot of people emailing me, telling me I read your story. It was really inspirational. And it's also still so great to still get those emails and like still get people reaching out. Um, even though my article was posted like six months ago, it just always reminds me that like, I have an obligation to do something for the queer community and uplift everyone in it. So I think that's great. Um, but my reaction was more on a local scale. So for me, it was my parents finding out I posted the article because I didn't tell them I was writing it. <laughs> so one day, one of their coworkers just like, hey, did you see what your kid wrote? <laughs> and then it was seeing that my soccer team, like some of them read it and I was getting they always knew I was a gay athlete and I always told them that. However, I think that writing this story really put in perspective to them. And also I, I called them out. You know, I told them, I was just like, in my article, I was like, there were things you were saying that were wrong. Have you been a great team? Yes. Have you been the best team I've been a part of? A hundred percent. However, there are certain individuals on this team that aren't, that aren't being inclusive, that aren't being kind in individuals. And so I think that sharing my story really just, it called out people and it really just put everything in perspective, and at least for me and my community, that I'm gonna advocate for change and that people are going to have to as well, if they're gonna be my friends, at least. I think you point out something very important there, Britton, um, and I'm curious to get Audrey's take on it. This piece of it, your affirmation to your team that you appreciated them, that it was a great team to be on, and some of them are really shitty. And it's something that I really appreciate seeing in, in young folks and the youth that I work with, you all are very able to hold two things at the same time. My generation was not taught to hold that. We were raised on the good versus evil, <laughs> very binary. <laughs> Glad we're breaking all that down. That you are able to hold, this team is still a great thing, I wanna be a part of it. And there are some things that you need to fix is, is critical. I'm curious how that showed up for you after, either after the article or in your work now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that you mentioned that as a generational thing, because I've always felt as though I was kind of between generations in, in terms of, of navigating that space. Um, and wanting to, I mean, I fundamentally believe that I've been an organizer for forever, right? Um, I came out when I was 17 years old. I've, I feel like I've been out for 11 years, which feels like a very, very long time. Um, and when I came out, I was uh, at an all girls Catholic high school. So there's, there's part of holding that complexity that is very much a survival mechanism in some ways. Um, there's part of it that I am, for the most part, a very like loving and forgiving person to, to a lot of people. And I, I believe that the work that I do needs to fundamentally be rooted in believing that people are capable of transformation, that people are, are capable of changing their opinions, um, changing their hearts and minds and all of the good stuff that we talk about in advocacy spaces. But also I've lived it and I've seen it. I When I came out, there wasn't anybody around me who was trans, who knew how to talk to trans people, who knew what they then pronouns were, who, and I've seen those same people now become some of the biggest advocates and champions like for change. And, and part of that was me being able to share my story with them and continue to extend compassion when possible and also set boundaries when needed. And when I just did not have the energy to explain things to some people, 
Um, and that's not to say that all of it was sunshine and flowers and roses, right? There were some people in my life that I had to cut out completely for a couple of years, but because I, I kind of have this like long form view of that now, um, a lot of them have come back into my life and they have apologized. Um, Britton was mentioning how, how his, sharing his story has had like a ripple effect. Um, you, I, I just want to say that like sharing my story has had an effect on, on people several years later where they tell me that me being able to do that um, and sh having me share my story and having them share my story with their families allowed them like the space for them to be able to explore their gender identity in a way that felt safe um, for them to come out as trans later. And that just kind of keeps happening throughout my life and it makes it so rewarding. And I, I really am so grateful for those moments that, that, make, that make it worth it. <laughs> yeah. I always love this idea of ripples, the things that we do standing on the shore of time and throwing pebbles in the lake and seeing what happens. They come and smack you upside the head sometimes too. Now, I'm gonna stay with you, Adri. What, what did sharing your story ultimately accomplish? Or has it not reached that point yet? I mean, I know there's a piece of it that you, you may not know what sharing your story four years ago is ultimately going to accomplish, but. I, I would like to think that I'm, I mean, at least a little bit part of the history of <laughs> advancing the queer movement. Um, like, as I said, when I came out, there were no queer trans brown people that I, that were visible to me. Um, and that's since changed. Um, I think it was the first step for me in being able to own my own truth. And um, I, I've, I've been on my own journey in that way and like expanding my own boundaries. And I hope that hopefully I get to share my story in, in bigger ways. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought a little bit and I wanted to add something, but I don't, I don't know. Hop back over to you. It was a hard question. I don't even know how I would answer it, which uh, is totally unfair because now I'm going to hop over to Trevor and ask what your sharing of your story has accomplished and what what you think the long term impact might be. Um, I think it's accomplished so much. Um, I just look back at all the growth that I have made. Um, I have only been out for a year and a half. So for me to even, for me to have even been able to been like, hey, like I don't agree with this and I'm not gonna tolerate this anymore. It really just shows me that I've come so far and, and especially where I live. Like I live in West Texas, guys, like conservative, whole entire town voted for Trump. Like one of the biggest conservative towns in Texas kind of vibe, like El Paso. I know that is rough too. Um, but for me to even have been able to do this in this town and to have gotten support from the Abilene Pride Alliance and just even people within my community, like I will be grateful for this experience for the rest of my life. And I think this is only a starting point, at least for me, um, because I wanna continue to share my story and I wanna continue to uplift other LGBTQIA people because our rights, our rights matter because we as people matter. And I think that I have accomplished so much already and I cannot wait for the future to continue to do more and to continue to speak for people who can't. No doubt that you will all continue doing that. Um, and I do hope that at least at one of those points, Trevor, you do it in a full set of acrylics sharpened to a, oh, perfect, not, well, sharpened to a point for, for maximum, maximum engagement. Britton, what do you think sharing your story has accomplished, either personally or in your community? I know that there's been a ripple, but. Yeah, so personally sharing my story accomplished everything I wanted it to. It was my way, the ultimate way of sharing my story um, to my teammates, my family, and just to myself and future generations. But as far as has my story accomplished everything I wanted it to do, not even close. <laughs> I mean, like, obviously we have like Carl Nassib who came out, 
groundbreaking, who's the first current active player in the NFL. We have Tom Daly, who just became an Olympic champion because he got gold. So like we're seeing all these strides we made in primarily athletics. However, when we think that there has been 23,000 people in the NFL, and we've only had really seven come out, I think, like after their career, during their career, it, you, can't, you can't say we've won yet because we haven't. And the, are we going to get to a point where we are going to win? Yes, but that doesn't mean we should ever stop fighting. And so my story has accomplished something, but it's not even, it's nowhere near where we need to be. <laughs> I think all the conversation has started. I, um, Frederick, please do let me know in the chat if we have a panel on this. I know that I'm speaking on this locally. Um, there's been a lot of focus on trans girls in particular in sports, trans boys too, but again, the legislature doesn't seem to understand that there's a difference between the two. Um, I'm very intrigued to see what happens with non-binary people and their participation in sports because then we're not even talking about the boys and girls team, are we? Love it. There'll be all sorts of stories to tell there. Given what's going on right now, actually in the Texas legislature, we've gone through a session already. We went kind, kind, of, kind of through a second special, sort of. I don't, I mean, when, when you have the Democrats leave the state to break quorum, um, can't really say that you had a special session, but I know that another one is starting on the 8th. Um, how, how have you been using your increased recognition within the community, your position within the ACLU, which I do need to acknowledge, the ACLU has been a partner of Out Youth and the Texas GSA Network for a very long time. And there is nothing that I have appreciated more than the ability to call the ACLU and have them write mean letters to principals and school districts. Excellent. Um, how do you use this recognition, your story, your, your reach in the work that you do for queer people across Texas? You know, uh... <laughs> I think I started this by saying that uh, I shared my story because I think being vulnerable and and um, genuine with people is so important. And I'm now, I'm, I feel really grateful and honored that I'm able to do that from a position at the ACLU of Texas as a policy and advocacy strategist who is also trans and has um, lived through and I think knows what it feels like to be under attack by a state legislature and to be able to share that perspective and framing with reporters and journalists um, and the impact that it has on their storytelling, I think is really important. And um, there are some reporters who just get it from like the get go, right? But there are so many reporters who do not get it from the get go. Um, for everyone good one, there are a couple who do not. Um, and in, in some ways, more of what I do, I think if you see my name in the, in the media with a quote, like I was talking to that reporter for probably five hours that week about, about trans kids and trans issues and the importance of covering these things in a certain way um, and, and how impactful the, the sports bans are, how impactful a medical care ban would be in the state. Um, that one is probably one of the hardest ones to talk about because I myself was somebody who did not have, have access to gender affirming healthcare in El Paso. And that was some of the hardest time years of my life, I would say. Um, and to propose that again years later after all of the progress that the, the queer community, LGBTQ community has made in terms of having greater access to civil and human, basic civil and human rights, but still so much to go, right? Um, it's just egregious and being able to share that and really humanize that for, for reporters and journalists is I think one of the strongest things that I'm able to do because then those media stories reach so far beyond those conversations that I'm having with that journalist. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's my favorite part of my job probably. And then the, those reporters like continue to cover the issue uh, for years to come and they're like following that beat. And that feels really great 
even even once you maybe stopped being like a source for them or because you're in a different media market. Like there's all passive journalists who still talk about these things because I talked to them many years ago about it. Yeah, that's the other interesting thing about sharing our stories is that they create connection, oftentimes beyond professional. The I same thing. I've been doing this work long enough that there are just reporters that will call me out of the blue saying, what do you think about X? I'm like, I don't, I, I, mean, I can talk about it, but I, sure. <laughs> and you're right. A lot of these relationships are built over hours and hours and hours of conversation that ultimately result in a quote. And there's some stamina that I think is really important to develop there that I would be interested to talk with you more about now that you're in Austin. I mean, I think um, something that I've learned over the years is that my favorite thing is relationship building and talking to people and getting to and meeting people where they're at. And so part of me existing as openly as a trans person as I possibly can in every way, shape and form um, is, po is made possible in so many ways by that being, I think one of the things that I love and is also a character strength that I'm trying to play into. <laughs> Trevor, how have you used your increased recognition? I mean, you've got, you have got an admirable amount of Instagram followers. You have an amount of Instagram followers that OutYouth would uh, gladly take. Um, so it, it's been, it's been crazy. Like I said, it's been crazy. Um, I actually ended up having to make a new Instagram because it got reported so much. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, now really I'm just using all of my platforms because I am very much into social media and I kind of always have been. And I think that is something that helped me with my story too, because I already had a decent following before um, this so that when it all was said and done, like a lot of people already did support me. So it was just like additional support, but um, I just use all of my platforms to uplift LGBTQIA um, youth and our issues that we are facing, especially in Texas. We all know how that goes, we all know. Um, but yeah, like, um, like Audrey said, I actually, that's been happening to me too. My story happened in November and I actually just recently did a story with what the Washington post, they did a story about, um, nail polish lines for men and kind of like how it's becoming a trend. And they called me and they're like, Hey, I would love to get your, um, your opinion on this. And uh, yeah, so I did that and I kind of just try to connect with other LGBTQIA youth. Um, like I'm going to Texas Tech in a week, actually. Um, I'm already gonna be involved in the LG, LGBTQIA, um, that organization. Um, I'm minoring in gender studies and majoring in political science. Like I am just using my voice and I'm trying to spread it as as far and as loud as I can, because like I said, we as people matter. And until, until we get to that point, I think that I will continue to advocate for the LGBTQIA community and I will continue to um, speak up. Yes, nail polish is everywhere. Britton, what about you? So recognition. <laughs> not honestly, not I me, mean, not really. Uh, just because my story, for the most part, uh, although I did get a bunch of messages from outward, it after the first week it died down. However, like the biggest impact that I got to see was definitely just within my team, my school, my coach. Had like some teachers just like pull me aside and just be like, "Thank you." Um, probably the best thing I got for my recognition was my coach apologized to me in a way. He was just like, "I'm sorry for anything I've ever said." Um, you know, I, I told him, I thank you. I accept your apology. However, if you're going to do this, then I need you to change. You know, you can't do the apology and then go back to saying stuff like how you were. And, you know, and, and in total honesty, he has really changed what he's doing. And 
that was probably the best positive impact I got to see it was just within my team and my school. So. Well, those local changes often have the most profound impact long term. So good on you. There's going to be tons of kids on that team. I mean, provided your coach doesn't retire next year. But you've changed him and you've changed everybody that you've played with. Audrey, you've done the most media out of everyone on this panel. <laughs> what uh, steps do you recommend that folks take before going to the media? Like if, if you have time to pre-plan approaching the media, like what do you need to have prepared? I, this is this is such a this is a difficult question. Um, I think, I mean, stories like Trevor's are so so incredible to reflect back on, right? Because it was kind of it was an impulsive decision, but I think the rawness of that moment made it all the more real and impactful in such a way that, like, if you had planned for it, I think I I think overthinking is not uh, anything that anyone should indulge in, though it's something I do frequently. Um, I think something important to consider is the maybe the negative consequences of sharing your story with the media. Um, I do think that the world is a little bit different these days. And I mean, there is a situation where Trevor's story could have gone differently, right? Um, but I do think and believe in like the fundamental transformation of, of the world versus 11 years ago and that we are on an, a narc of justice that is bending in our favor. Um, but I had negative things happen from the ability that like anybody could Google me and learn that I was transgender that resulted in like being denied job opportunities or being fired. And that can't happen anymore. Thank you, Supreme Court. But I've like I've been out for so long, right, that it did impede, for example, my ability to become a teacher in El Paso um, because my students were able to Google me and learn that and share it with their parents. And if a parent had a negative feeling about it, they could go to the principal and report that. Um, and I think I this is the same advice I would give to anybody before coming out, right, is make sure that like you have a safety plan. Um, and that you have that um, in place in case that something does not go well and you need somewhere to stay or you need to find a job or you need something along those lines. Um, but I think as long as you're speaking from the heart and doing it with good intentions for the most part, you like it always goes well. I appreciate you bringing up the idea of and the importance of safety planning. Uh, Frederick, will you pull that link for us from last year? Last year at Keepless CDU, we did a whole session on safety planning that if you are considering going to the media with your own story, please give that a watch first. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there is something very telling about Trevor's experience in particular that you didn't prepare, um, which spins this question around on you the opposite way. Uh, do you wish you had prepared? Um, that, that's a, a difficult question, but honestly, I don't wish I would have prepared. Um, I kind of knew I, like, I've grown up here my whole entire life, so I kind of knew what was going to be said or the reaction, at least in my community, and what was going to happen. Um, but honestly, I didn't care. And I think that me not planning uh, what what like what steps I was gonna do before all of this kind of like Audrey said really helped me and showed the rawness of my story and the impact and how how not okay like my I was crying I was crying and that just I think that really just showed the emotion and how I how I felt at that moment. So if I had the choice, I don't think I would plan. Um, but I think if if that is something that anybody wants to do to plan ahead, I think what Audrey said is make a safety plan and kind of weigh out the pros and the cons. And if you deem the pros that are the pros are going to outweigh the cons, then most definitely do it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with planning. But for me, I I would not change it. 
totally understandable. Um, Britain, you obviously did a lot of thinking. You even wrote the article. You posted it without your parents knowing. Can you tell us, walk us through what the preparation was for that? And did any of these things factor in? Is there anything that you wish you'd done differently? Yeah, so um, off the bat, I wish I would have just told my story. I don't know why, but for some reason I was reading other people's and I thought it had to be this epic, amazing, cool thing where like I, I solved world hunger, I did everything and I was the best. That's not at all you need to do <laughs> because I found that just by simply just like the rawness, the genuality of my, like my piece, the thing, that was the best part of it. And so I would say just for anyone, make sure you're telling your story and not someone else's because I found myself trying to tell someone else's and it wasn't very good. <laughs> that would... So that brings up a very important point. I'm gonna add two things that I have learned in all of these years about preparing to go to the media. Do not lie. Do not, there is an internet now. Uh, people can figure out very quickly when you are lying. Um, and I do often recommend that you have some talking points ready because sometimes they will try to trap you into saying something that you don't want to say and it is very easy to just not get them what they want. Um, and practice, lots of practice. Don't do what I did, which was sent out a press release and had never given an interview before and then uh, every news station in Austin showed up all at the same time and I was live on the 10 o'clock news. Uh, yeah, that is a story for another day. Don't do that. It was very nerve wracking. All right, last question. And this is uh, very much in keeping with what Britain's Post did, which is speaking to the future. What tips do you have for other LGBTQIA plus teens who want to use the media for equality in our community? And I will start with Britain. So my biggest piece of advice would be if you're in a situation in which you are able to, and you know, you're going to be I like have accepted parents, I would do it. If it's something that you feel comfortable enough to do, I really think about sharing your story for the reasons of when you share your story, it's going to help you. It's going to help the people around you and it's going to help the next generation. And to me, that's one of the best things you can do is just to leave a better legacy for the next group to come. And I think that's very, like, I I have to thank, like, I have to thank everyone else who's on this panel. Like, you all made it easier for me. Trevor, I remember, I remember signing his petition. Like, um, and I remember seeing that and being like, wow, this is inspiring. And you know, even something that happened in Abilene, Texas was able to reach me and Keller. And so I think it's the best thing if you were able to tell your story in a position which you can, I would do it. Yeah, there's some power in the storytelling there that is often missed, which is the difference between feeling lonely and being alone. We try to teach that to our youth here at Out Youth a lot, that being lonely is understandable and it's something that we all go through. There's something about telling your story that can help remove the feeling of being alone, which is much deeper. It sits farther back in the soul than I think any of us want to admit. Um, but I remember reading stories too online. We did have the internet when I was your age. It was very slow. It made a terrible noise. But reading stories is what made me feel safe to come out in ninth grade, which is mind boggling too. Uh, Trevor, what about you? What would you tell your fellow teens I I would say do it if you want to use the social if you want to use social media, I one thousand percent think you should do it. Um, like everyone said, I think there's a beauty in storytelling, and I think it's a way a way for all of us to connect on an even deeper level. Um, and for people to know that they aren't alone, and that there are so many people in this in this nasty, terrible world that can relate to them, and that love them, and will be there for them. And I, the ripple effect, it really, it really is. When we share our stories, more and more people connect with us, and they they're inspired. They want to make a change. They want to speak out about all of these issues, 
And I would just say, do it. And I would say, surround yourself around people that you know support you, because ultimately those are the only people that matter. If anybody doesn't support you, that is completely their loss. And I, I say, do it. Yes, the power of having strong allies surrounding us. And yes, my friend, what would you tell the youth? What would I tell the youth now about sharing their story? It probably that it's worth it, regardless of how you do it and where you do it. I mean, whatever platform it is that is used, I think it has changed changes so often now. Um, but as you were mentioning that like you would you would seek out like other other people that look like you and stories of, of folks who look like you or whose experiences parallel yours in some way. And I, it reminded me of like the flashback of being on Tumblr and like looking at people's like YouTube video channels <laughs> of their transitions and finding so much peace and like comfort and just knowing that I wasn't alone and that somebody else was, was recording their experience and their story. Um, even if it didn't match mine, it, they were like giving me the words and the language to start being able to to find my place in the world in a way that would have been impossible, I think, without technology. Um, in a way that like they probably had no idea that making their video in like in the Midwest of the United States in their <laughs> attic of their living room is going to reach me several years later in El Paso, right? And I. I followed so many of like the folks who are like now YouTube stars for doing this, like way, like way before they were famous though, right? Like when it was just like a handful of us on Tumblr and it, um, like that's so important. So, and I like, I can't even conceptualize what that looks like now for, for the youth of who are like, who's 17 years, years old now on the internet or on TikTok, like, on trans TikTok, I guess finding like the next like trans TikTok star that they that is sharing their story and like creating a whole new community for them to be able to find peace in um, peace and belonging in right. So I guess the only thing I have to say is that sharing your story, um, regardless of the platform and regardless of like the length or format of it, um, it doesn't always have to be in the media. Media is a lot of things. Sometimes it is like a journalist or a reporter, um, but in so many ways, it's just important to, to start getting that practice, even like um, start getting that practice and finding your footing and like finding your own story um, in whatever way that you can. And that like the story, I think, you know what? I take this back. My therapist just gave me like a really important piece of advice at 28 years of old. And it's that the story that somebody else says is your story, like doesn't have to be your story. And you have the complete power of deciding what your story is. Um, and I think we get trapped like in cycles of, of repeating our story in a certain way. Um, and sometimes that way I, can be really tragic or it can be defined by our parents or by the community that we grew up in. Um, but you can define that for yourself. And I think it's something that is missing that we still need to build more of I th in the world is telling like stories of joy and hope as an LGBTQ community and things that inspire others and so being able to believe that there is a future where we can be happy because so much of the narrative has just been how um, how how we're being kept from public access in life or how somebody is uh, thinking that we shouldn't play sports or shouldn't use a bathroom um, but there's so much joy and love and beauty in our community. And a lot of it is rooted in resistance from the very beginning. And I think those stories are important, but also just how we can be full complex human beings feeling joy outside of having to resist to exist. Thanks for letting me. I lost my mute button. Yes. One of the things I saw that uh, Frederick beat me to the shameless plug. Um, I wrote a book, Trans Plus Love, Sex, Romance, and Being You. It's a growing up guide for trans and non-binary youth and all the people who love that. I was not going to bring it up until we started talking about this piece of stories and feeling alone. 
One of the things that was most impactful in writing this book, in chapter one, we go through all of the places around the world throughout time that trans and non-binary people have existed and all of the words that have been used to describe our people. And even writing this book at 34 years old, like it was a very powerful moment to feel less alone that like trans people didn't just suddenly bloom out of the ground in 2007. As much as everyone wants to convince us that's what happened. Um, so there's also another piece of the book that I like to bring up, especially given what Patrice brought up, which is the trans narrative. Speaking of stories, the, the danger of narratives that are told for us as a community, regardless of our sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and how that gets us trapped in ways of being and identifying that may not necessarily be ours or may not be ours anymore, that it's all okay. And the beauty of storytelling, and now that I'm, I am writing another book, I'm co-writing a, uh, like a, well, no, I don't think I'm allowed to tell the plot. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mystery, it's a mystery now, it's a murder mystery and it has queer people in it. It's great, no queer people die because there's been enough of that, right? Um, but the power in doing that is that, you know, you can edit a story, right? You can go back and you can change it, which is what we're doing right now. And you can do that with your own story too. Whether you've told that in the media or you told it to your best friend in secret last Friday at the sleepover, doesn't matter where you tell your story as long as you're telling it and it's authentic to you and that it's not gonna put you in more danger than you were before. So anything else our panelists would like to add before we wrap up for today? I just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for letting me be a part of this. And thank you, Britton and Audrey, you guys are doing so amazing. You guys are so inspiring to me. I just want to make that known. I think you guys are amazing, all of you. And I just wanted to say thank you. I always want to give other people a chance to talk in case I'm talking too much, but like same. I uh, thank you for having me. I and for both of you, for all of you really for being on this panel. I had no idea you wrote a book that's incredible. Um, thank well, you. are in Austin now. I'll drop off a copy. Thank you. Please. Um, and yeah, just thank you to all of you for, for doing the work that you do and for sharing yourselves with the world. Thank you as well. Just thank you for having me. It was really great. Also, everyone should go vote. It's really important. <laughs> yeah. please, please continue voting. It would make a lot of this a lot easier. Vote, wear a mask, get vaccinated. And, and wear a mask, yes. All of the, please stay alive. Get vaccinated. Do none of us any good if you are not alive, right? All right, I will leave it there for today and turn it back over to Frederick to wrap it up for us. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's, I, I have the pleasure of knowing all of your stories somewhat, but there's something even more awesome about getting to hear you talk about your stories and how you told your stories and how and the effects that those have had in your community and in our community. Um, so thank you all for being here. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I did drop another couple links in the chat and those will be included um, in the final presentation as well where you, with the video. Um, I'm from Driftwood. Um, Driftwood, Texas is also a tiny rural place and um, one of our colleagues there um, created this project for rural LGBTQ Texans to tell their stories. Um, similarly, Project Contrast is a national organization that does similar things. Trevor has worked with them um, and they are doing a national book tour um, to collect the stories of LGBTQ youth across the country that will be published. Trevor, do you know when it's going to be published? When the book's supposed to come out? Um, I he never told me that. Um, I actually just took my pictures for it uh, about like two weeks ago, 
And I, I know that he said that Texas was one of the first places that he stopped. So he's still going to have to go all the way around. So I would assume it's going to be a minute, but he told me he would let me know when the launch party is. So definitely. <laughs> awesome. And then we would love for all y'all to join us for our upcoming Keepless EDU sessions. Tomorrow, um, we have a panelist from last year coming back to join us again. Uh, tomorrow's session is navigating power differentials in romantic relationships. Um, and then next week on Monday is a session for parents. It's called using your powers for good, um, how to affect change on school campuses. And then Tuesday is an intergenerational chat between bisexual men. And Thursday, Trevor will be back with us again for our regional GSA coalition panel. Um, and then on Friday, um, I will be presenting on finding um, inclusive uh, professional development. And that one is aimed at teachers and school staff. So we hope that you will join us. We have sessions all throughout August um, and the 27th, back to Britain's point, go vote. Um, the 27th, our final uh, panel of the uh, Cupola CDU 2021 um, will feature uh, our friends at the ACLU of Texas, at TENT, the Transgender Education Network of Texas, um, Equality Texas, uh, as well as the mayor of West Hollywood. So may, be sure to join us for that one. <laughs> Thanks y'all so much for joining us. We hope you have a great day, great rest of your week. And yeah. Happy Wait, weekend. guys, can I take a picture? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody smile. Period. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, y'all. Bye, guys. Bye, bye.